The Statue of Liberty is a colossal neoclassical sculpture on Liberty Island in New York Harbor in New York City, in the United States. The copper statue, a gift from the people of France, was designed by French sculptor F.R. Tilde Copyright D.A. Tilde Copyright Trickle Gust Bartholdi and its metal framework was built by Gustav Eiffel. The statue was dedicated on October 28, 1886. The statue is a figure of Libertas. A robed Roman liberty goddess, she holds a torch above her head with her right hand, and in her left hand carries a tabula and sata inscribed July 4 v. July 4, 1776, in Roman numerals, the date of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. A broken shackle and chain lie at her feet as she walks forward, commemorating the recent national abolition of slavery. After its dedication, the statue became an icon of freedom in the United States seen as a symbol of welcome to immigrants arriving by sea. Bartholdi was inspired by a French law professor and politician, Atilde du Artren Atilde Copyright de Lable, who is said to have commented in 1865 that any monument raised to U.S. independence would properly be a joint project of the French and American peoples. The Franco-Prussian War delayed progress until 1875 when Lable proposed that the French finance the statue and the United States provide the site and build the pedestal. Bartholdi completed the head and the torch-bearing arm before the statue was fully designed, and these pieces were exhibited for publicity at international expositions. The torch-bearing arm was displayed at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876 and in Madison Square Park in Manhattan from 1876 to 1882. Fundraising proved difficult, especially for the Americans, and by 1885 work on the pedestal was threatened by a lack of funds. Publisher Joseph Pulitzer, of the New York World, started a drive for donations to finish the project and attracted more than 120,000 contributors, most of whom gave less than a dollar equivalent to $30 in 2021. The statue was built in France, shipped overseas in crates, and assembled on the completed pedestal on what was then called Bedlow's Island. The statue's completion was marked by New York's first ticker tape parade and a dedication ceremony presided over by President Grover Cleveland. The statue was administered by the United States Lighthouse Board until 1901 and then by the Department of War since 1933 it has been maintained by the National Park Service as part of the Statue of Liberty National Monument and is a major tourist attraction. Limited numbers of visitors can access the rim of the pedestal and the interior of the statue's crown from within public access to the torch has been barred since 1916. Both the Roman god Libertas and sun god Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, pictured, influenced the design of liberty enlightening the world. According to the National Park Service, the idea of a monument presented by the French people to the United States was first proposed by Atilde du Artren Atilde Copyright de Lable, president of the French Anti-Slavery Society and a prominent and important political thinker of his time. The project is traced to a mid-1865 conversation between Lable, a staunch abolitionist, and F.R. Atilde Copyright D. Atilde Copyright Rick Bartholdi, a sculptor. In an after-dinner conversation at his home near Versailles, Lable, an ardent supporter of the Union in the American Civil War, is supposed to have said, if a monument should rise in the United States, as a memorial to their independence, I should think it only natural if it were built by United Effort a common work of both our nations. The National Park Service, in a 2000 report, however, deemed this a legend traced to an 1885 fundraising pamphlet, and that the statue was most likely conceived in 1870. In another essay on their website, the Park Service suggested that Lable was minded to honor the Union victory and its consequences with the abolition of slavery and the Union's victory in the Civil War in 1865, Lable's wishes of freedom and democracy were turning into a reality in the United States. To honor these achievements, Lable proposed that a gift be built for the United States on behalf of France. Lable hoped that by calling attention to the recent achievements of the United States, the French people would be inspired to call for their democracy in the face of a repressive monarchy. According to sculptor F.R.A. Tilde Copyright D.A. Tilde Copyright Trickle Goose Bartholdi, 
who later recounted the story, Labley's alleged comment was not intended as a proposal, but it inspired Bartholdi. Given the repressive nature of the regime of Napoleon III, Bartholdi took no immediate action on the idea except to discuss it with Labley. Bartholdi was in any event busy with other possible projects in the late 1860s. He approached Ismail Pasha, Khedive of Egypt, with a plan to build progress or Egypt carrying the light to Asia, one a huge lighthouse in the form of an ancient Egyptian female fella or peasant, robed and holding a torch aloft, at the northern entrance to the Suez Canal in Port Said. Sketches and models were made of the proposed work, though it was never erected. There was a classical precedent for the Suez proposal, the Colossus of Rhodes an ancient bronze statue of the Greek god of the sun, Helios. This statue is believed to have been over 100 feet, 30 meters, high, and it similarly stood as a harbor entrance and carried a light to guide ships. Both the Khedive and Lesseps declined the proposed statue from Bartholdi, citing the expensive cost. The port said lighthouse was built instead. By Fran A. Tilde Section is Cognet in 1869. Any large project was further delayed by the Franco Prussian War, in which Bartholdi served as a major of the militia. In the war, Napoleon III was captured and deposed. Bartholdi's home province of Alsace was lost to the Prussians, and a more liberal republic was installed in France. As Bartholdi had been planning a trip to the United States, he and Labley decided the time was right to discuss the idea with influential Americans. In June 1871, Bartholdi crossed the Atlantic, with letters of introduction signed by Labley. Arriving at New York Harbor, Bartholdi focused on Bedloe's Island, now named Liberty Island, as a site for the statue, struck by the fact that vessels arriving in New York had to sail past it. He was delighted to learn that the island was owned by the United States government. It had been ceded by the New York State Legislature in 1800 for harbor defense. It was thus, as he put it in a letter to Labley, land common to all the states. Six as well as meeting many influential New Yorkers, Bartholdi visited President Ulysses S. Grant who assured him that it would not be difficult to obtain the site for the statue. Bartholdi crossed the United States twice by rail and met many Americans who he thought would be sympathetic to the project, but he remained concerned that popular opinion on both sides of the Atlantic was insufficiently supportive of the proposal, and he and Labley decided to wait before mounting a public campaign. Bartholdi made the first model of his concept in 1870, the son of a friend of Bartholdi's. Artist John Lafarge, later maintained that Bartholdi made the first sketches for the statue during his visit to Lafarge's Rhode Island studio. Bartholdi continued to develop the concept following his return to France. He also worked on several sculptures designed to bolster French patriotism after the defeat by the Prussians. One of these was the Lion of Belfort, a monumental sculpture carved in sandstone below the fortress of Belfort which during the war had resisted a Prussian siege for over three months. The defiant lion, 73 feet, 22 meters, long and half in height, displays an emotional quality characteristic of romanticism, which Bartholdi would later bring to the Statue of Liberty. Detail from an 1855 A56 fresco by Constantino Brumidi in the Capitol in Washington, D.C., showing two early symbols of America, Columbia, left and the Indian princess. Bartholdi and Labley considered how best to express the idea of American liberty. In early American history, two female figures were frequently used as cultural symbols of the nation. One of these symbols, the personified Columbia, was seen as an embodiment of the United States in the manner that Britannia was identified with the United Kingdom, and Marianne came to represent France. Colombia had supplanted the traditional European personification of the Americas as an Indian princess, which had come to be regarded as uncivilized and derogatory toward Americans. The other significant female icon in American culture was a representation of liberty, derived from Libertas, the goddess of freedom widely worshipped in ancient Rome especially among emancipated slaves. A liberty figure adorned most American coins of the time, and representations of liberty appeared in popular and civic art, including Thomas Crawford's Statue of Freedom, 1863, atop the dome of the United States Capitol building. 
The statue's design evokes iconography evident in ancient history including the Egyptian goddess Isis, the ancient Greek deity of the same name, the Roman Columbia, and the Christian iconography of the Virgin Mary. Artists of the 18th and 19th centuries striving to evoke republican ideals commonly used representations of liberties as an allegorical symbols. A figure of liberty was also depicted on the Great Seal of France, however, Bartholdi and Labley avoided an image of revolutionary liberty such as that depicted in Agathe Ilda Diaris's Ni Delacroix's famed Liberty Leading the People, 1830. In this painting, which commemorates France's July Revolution, a half-clothed liberty leads an armed mob over the bodies of the fallen. Labley had no sympathy for revolution, so Bartholdi's figure would be fully dressed in flowing robes. Instead of the impression of violence in the Delacroix work, Bartholdi wished to give the statue a peaceful appearance and chose a torch, representing progress, for the figure to hold. Crawford's statue was designed in the early 1850s. It was originally to be crowned with the pilus, the cap given to emancipated slaves in ancient Rome. Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, a southerner who would later serve as President of the Confederate States of America, was concerned that the pilus would be taken as an abolitionist symbol. He ordered that it be changed to a helmet. Delacroix's figure wears a pilus and Bartholdi at first considered placing one on his figure as well. Instead, he used a radiant diadem, or crown, to top its head. In so doing, he avoided a reference to Marianne, who invariably wears a pilus. The seven rays form a hail or aureole. They evoke the sun, the seven seas, and the seven continents, and represent another means, besides the torch, whereby liberty enlightens the world. Bartholdi's early models were all similar in concept, a female figure in neoclassical style representing liberty, wearing a stola and perla, gown and cloak, common in depictions of Roman goddesses, and holding a torch aloft. According to popular accounts, the face was modeled after that of Charlotte Basser Bartholdi, the sculptor's mother, but Regis Huber, the curator of the Bartholdi Museum is on record as saying that this as well as other similar speculations, have no basis. He designed the figure with the strong, uncomplicated silhouette, which would be set off well by its dramatic harbor placement and allow passengers on vessels entering New York Bay to experience a changing perspective on the statue as they proceeded toward Manhattan. He gave it bold classical contours and applied simplified modeling reflecting the huge scale of the project and its solemn purpose. Bartholdi wrote of his technique, the surfaces should be broad and simple, defined by a bold and clear design, accentuated in the important places. The enlargement of the details or their multiplicity is to be feared. By exaggerating the forms, to render them more clearly visible, or by enriching them with details, we would destroy the proportion of the work. Finally, the model, like the design, should have a summarized character, such as one would give to a rapid sketch. Only it is necessary that this character should be the product of volition and study, and that the artist, concentrating his knowledge, should find the form and the line in its greatest simplicity. Bartholdi made alterations to the design as the project evolved. Bartholdi considered having Liberty hold the broken chain but decided this would be too divisive in the days after the Civil War. The erected statue thus tried over a broken chain, half hidden by her robes and difficult to see from the ground. Bartholdi was initially uncertain of what to place in Liberty's left hand he settled on a tabula and sat a comma for used to evoke the concept of law. Though Bartholdi greatly admired the United States Constitution, he chose to inscribe July formed looks beyond the tablet thus associating the date of the country's declaration of independence with the concept of liberty. Bartholdi interested his friend and mentor, architect Agathe Ilda Diaris's Ni Violet Leduc, in the project. As chief engineer, Violet Leduc designed the brick pier within the statue, to which the skin would be anchored. After consultations with the metalwork foundry Gagat, Godieco, Violet Leduc chose the metal which would be used for the skin, copper sheets and the method used to shape it, repis a tilde copyright, in which the sheets were heated and then struck with wooden hammers. An advantage of this choice was that the entire statue would be light for its volume, as the copper need be only 0.094 inches, too. 
thick, Bartholdi had decided on a height of just over 151 feet, 46 meters, for the statue, double that of Italy's San Carlo and the German statue of Arminius, both made with the same method. By 1875, France was enjoying improved political stability and a recovering post-war economy. A growing interest in the upcoming Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia led Leblin to decide it was time to seek public support. In September 1875, he announced the project and the formation of the Franco-American Union as its fundraising arm. With the announcement, the statue was given a name. Liberty enlightening the world. The French would finance the statue Americans would be expected to pay for the pedestal. The announcement provoked a generally favorable reaction in France, though many Frenchmen resented the United States for not coming to their aid during the war with Prussia. French monarchists opposed the statute, if for no other reason than it was proposed by the liberal Leblé, who had recently been elected a senator for life. Leblé arranged events designed to appeal to the rich and powerful including a special performance at the Paris Opera on April 25, 1876, that featured a new cantata by composer Charles Gounod. The piece was titled La Liberté et il de copyright et il de copyright Clarent Le Monde. The French version of the statue's announced name initially focused on the elites. The union was successful in raising funds from across French society. Schoolchildren and ordinary citizens gave as did 181 French municipalities. Leblay's political allies supported the call, as did descendants of the French contingent in the American Revolutionary War. Less idealistically, contributions came from those who helped for American support in the French attempt to build the Panama Canal. The copper may have come from multiple sources and some of it is said to have come from a mine in business. Norway Comet 2 though this has not been conclusively determined after testing samples. According to Kara Sutherland in her book on the statue for the Museum of the City of New York, 200,000 pounds, 91,000 kilograms, was needed to build the statue, and the French copper industrialist at Gate Ilde Diaresis Nisecrate Ilde Copyright and donated 128,000 pounds, 58,000 kilograms, of copper. Although plans for the statue had not been finalized, Bartholdi moved forward with the fabrication of the right arm, bearing the torch, and a head. Work began at the Gadget, Gaudier Company workshop. In May 1876, Bartholdi traveled to the United States as a member of a French delegation to the Centennial Exhibition, comma 6 and arranged for a huge painting of the statue to be shown in New York as part of the Centennial festivities. The arm did not arrive in Philadelphia until August because of its late arrival. It was not listed in the exhibition catalog, and while some reports correctly identified the work, Others called it the Colossal Arm or Bartholdi Electric Light. The exhibition grounds contained several monumental artworks to compete for fairgoers' interest, including an outsized fountain designed by Bartholdi. Nevertheless, the arm proved popular in the exhibition's waning days, and visitors would climb up to the balcony of the torch to view the fairgrounds. After the exhibition closed, the arm was transported to New York where it remained on display in Madison Square Park for several years before it was returned to France to join the rest of the statue. During his second trip to the United States, Bartholdi addressed several groups about the project and urged the formation of American committees of the Franco-American Union. Committees to raise money to pay for the foundation and pedestal were formed in New York, Boston and Philadelphia. The New York group eventually took on most of the responsibility for American fundraising and is often referred to as the American Committee. One of its members was 19-year-old Theodore Roosevelt, the future governor of New York and president of the United States. On March 3, 1877, on his final full day in office, President Grant signed a joint resolution that authorized the president to accept the statue when it was presented by France and to select a site for it. President Rutherford B. Hayes, who took office the following day, selected the Bedloes Island site that Bartholdi had proposed. On his return to Paris in 1877, Bartholdi concentrated on completing the head, which was exhibited at the 1878 Paris World's Fair. Fundraising continued, with models of the statue put on sale. Tickets to view the construction activity at the Gadget, 
Gaudier Company workshop were also offered. The French government authorized a lottery among the prizes were valuable silver plates and a terracotta model of the statue. By the end of 1879, about 250,000 francs had been raised. The head and arm had been built with assistance from Violet Ledoc, who fell ill in 1879. He soon died, leaving no indication of how he intended to transition from the copper skin to his proposed masonry pier. The following year, Bartholdi was able to obtain the services of the innovative designer and builder Gustav Eiffel. Eiffel and his structural engineer, Morris Kochlin decided to abandon the pier and instead build an iron truss tower. Eiffel opted not to use a completely rigid structure, which would force stresses to accumulate in the skin and lead eventually to cracking. A secondary skeleton was attached to the center pylon. Then, to enable the statue to move slightly in the winds of New York Harbor and as the metal expanded on hot summer days, he loosely connected the support structure to the skin using flat iron bars, which culminated in a mesh of metal straps, known as saddles, that were riveted to the skin, providing firm support. In a labor-intensive process, each saddle had to be crafted individually, to prevent galvanic corrosion between the copper skin and the iron support structure, Eiffel insulated the skin with asbestos impregnated with shellac. Eiffel's design made the statue one of the earliest examples of curtain wall construction, in which the exterior of the structure is not load-bearing, but is instead supported by an interior framework. He included two interior spiral staircases, to make it easier for visitors to reach the observation point in the crown. Access to an observation platform surrounding the torch was also provided, but the narrowness of the arm allowed for only a single ladder, 40 feet, 12 meters, Long. As the pylon tower rose, Eiffel and Bartholdi coordinated their work carefully so that completed segments of skin would fit exactly on the support structure. The components of the pylon tower were built in the Eiffel factory in the nearby Parisian suburb of Livlos Perret. The change in structural material from masonry to iron allowed Bartholdi to change his plans for the statue's assembly. He had originally expected to assemble the skin on site as the masonry pier was built instead. He decided to build the statue in France and have it disassembled and transported to the United States for reassembly in place on Bedloe's Island. In a symbolic act, the first rivet placed into the skin, fixing a copper plate onto the statue's big toe was driven by United States Ambassador to France Levi P. Morton. The skin was not, however, crafted in exact sequence from low to high work proceeded on several segments simultaneously in a manner often confusing to visitors. Some work was performed by contractors so one of the fingers was made to Bartholdi's exacting specifications by a coppersmith in the southern French town of Montauban. By 1882, the statue was complete up to the waist. An event Bartholdi celebrated by inviting reporters to lunch on a platform built within the statue. Leblay died in 1883. He was succeeded as chairman of the French committee by Ferdinand de Lesseps, builder of the Suez Canal. The completed statue was formally presented to Ambassador Morton at a ceremony in Paris on July 4, 1884 and the Lesseps announced that the French government had agreed to pay for its transport to New York. The statue remained intact in Paris pending sufficient progress on the pedestal by January 1885. This had occurred and the statue was disassembled and crated for its ocean voyage. Richard Morris Hunt's pedestal was under construction in June 1885. The committees in the United States faced great difficulties in obtaining funds for the construction of the pedestal. The Panic of 1873 led to an economic depression that persisted through much of the decade. The Liberty Statue Project was not the only such undertaking that had difficulty raising money. Construction of the obelisk later known as the Washington Monument sometimes stalled for years it would ultimately take over three and a half decades to complete. There was criticism both of Bartholdi's statue and of the fact that the gift required Americans to foot the bill for the pedestal. In the years following the Civil War, most Americans preferred realistic artworks depicting heroes and events from the nation's history, rather than allegorical works like the Liberty Statue. There was also a feeling that Americans should design American public works of the selection of Italian-born Constantino Brumetti to decorate the Capitol had provoked intense criticism, even though he was a naturalized U.S. citizen. Harper's Weekly declared its wish that them.
Bartholdi and our French cousins had gone the whole figure while they were about it, and given a statue and pedestal at once.3 The New York Times stated that no true patriotic can countenance any such expenditures for bronze females in the present state of our finances.4 Faced with these criticisms, the American committees took little action for several years. Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, June 1885, showing, clockwise from left, woodcuts of the completed statue in Paris, Bartholdi, and the statue's interior structure. The foundation of Bartholdi's statue was to be laid inside Fort Wood, a disused army base on Bedloe's Island constructed between 1807 and 1811. Since 1823, it had rarely been used, though, during the Civil War. It had served as a recruiting station. The fortifications of the structure were in the shape of an 11 point star. The statue's foundation and pedestal were aligned so that it would face southeast, greeting ships entering the harbor from the Atlantic Ocean. In 1881, the New York Committee commissioned Richard Morris Hunt to design the pedestal. Within months, Hunt submitted a detailed plan, indicating that he expected construction to take about nine months. He proposed a pedestal 114 feet, 35 meters, in height faced with money problems. The committee reduced that to 89 feet, 27 meters. Hunt's pedestal design contains elements of classical architecture, including Doric portals as well as some elements influenced by Aztec architecture. The large mass is fragmented with architectural detail, to focus attention on the statue. In form, it is a truncated pyramid, 62 feet, 19 meters, square at the base and 39 feet, 12.0 meters, at the top. The four sides are identical in appearance. Above the door on each side. There are ten discs upon which Bartholdi proposed to place the coats of arms of the states. Between 1876 and 1889, there were 38 of them, although this was not done. Above that, a balcony was placed on each side, framed by pillars. Bartholdi placed an observation platform near the top of the pedestal, above which the statue itself rises. According to author Louis Auchincloss, the pedestal craggily evokes the power of an ancient Europe over which rises the dominating figure of the Statue of Liberty. The committee hired former Army General Charles Palmer Oystone to oversee the construction work. Construction on the 15-foot deep, 4. M. Foundation began in 1883, and the pedestal's cornerstone was laid in 1884. In Hunt's original conception, the pedestal was to have been made of solid granite. Financial concerns again forced him to revise his plans. The final design called for poured concrete walls, up to 20 feet, 6 m thick, faced with granite blocks. This stony creek granite came from the Beatty Quarry in Branford, Connecticut. The concrete mass was the largest poured at that time. Norwegian immigrant civil engineer Rio Alcom Gossen G. A. Tilda Broken Barver designed the structural framework for the Statue of Liberty. His work involved design computations, detailed fabrication and construction drawings, and oversight of construction. In completing his engineering for the statue's frame, G. A. A. Tilda Broken Barver worked from drawings and sketches produced by Gustav Eiffel. Fundraising in the U.S. for the pedestal had begun in 1882. The committee organized a large number of money-raising events. As part of one such effort, an auction of art and manuscripts, poet Emma Lazarus was asked to donate an original work. She initially declined, stating she could not write a poem about the statue. At the time, she was also involved in aiding refugees to New York who had fled anti-Semitic pogroms in Eastern Europe. These refugees were forced to live in conditions that the wealthy Lazarus had never experienced. She saw a way to express her empathy for these refugees in terms of the statue. The resulting sonnet, The New Colossus, including the lines Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free is uniquely identified with a Statue of Liberty in American culture and is inscribed on a plaque in its museum. Even with these efforts, fundraising lagged. Grover Cleveland, the governor of New York, vetoed their bill to provide $50,000 for the statue project in 1884. An attempt the next year to have Congress provide $100,000, sufficient to complete the project, also failed. The New York Committee with only $3,000 in the bank, 
suspended work on the pedestal, with the project in jeopardy. Groups from other American cities, including Boston and Philadelphia, offered to pay the full cost of erecting the statue in return for relocating it. Joseph Pulitzer, the publisher of the New York World, a New York newspaper, announced a drive to raise $100,000 at the equivalent of $2. Million today, Pulitzer pledged to print the name of every contributor, no matter how small the amount is given. The drive captured the imagination of New Yorkers, especially when Pulitzer began publishing the notes he received from contributors. A young girl alone in the world donated 60 cents, the result of self denial. One, one donor gave 5 cents as a poor office boy's might toward the pedestal fund. A group of children sent a dollar as the money we saved to go to the circus with. To another dollar was given by a lonely and very aged woman. One resident of a home for alcoholics in New York's rival city of Brooklyn. The cities would not merge until 1898. A donated $15. Other drinkers helped out through donation boxes in bars and saloons. A kindergarten class in Davenport, Iowa, mailed the world a gift of $1. As the donations flooded in, the committee resumed work on the pedestal. France raised about $250,000 to build the statue while the United States had to raise to $300,000 to build the pedestal. On June 17, 1885, the French steamer is Atil de Diarrhesis re-arrived in New York with the crates holding the disassembled statue on board. New Yorkers displayed their newfound enthusiasm for the statue. 200,000 people lined the docks and hundreds of boats were put to sea to welcome the ship. After five months of daily calls to donate to the statue fund, on August 11, 1885, the world announced that $102,000 had been raised from 120,000 donors and that 80% of the total had been received in sums of less than $1, equivalent to $30 in 2021. Even with the success of the fund drive, the pedestal was not completed until April 1886. Immediately thereafter, the reassembly of the statue began. Eiffel's iron framework was anchored to steel I-beams within the concrete pedestal and assembled. Zero. Once this was done, the sections of the skin were carefully attached. Due to the width of the pedestal, it was not possible to erect scaffolding, and workers dangled from ropes while installing the skin sections.